Isn't it great that you can buy a great introduction by sponsoring an event? <laughs> so if the first one is a keynote, this must then be a lock note or something like, like that. So I was planning to, to tell you that I have sort of an admission to make, and that is that my wife is a teacher. She teaches special kids 20 kilometers from here. But what I really want to tell you is thank you. Thank you for the work that you are doing, and thank you for existing. Thank you for being here today. If we just can teach every kid in the world by teachers who know what they are doing, who are passionate, who are motivated, who have tools that they need, the world will inevitably be a better place. There's no doubt about that. But the world is changing, and it has been changing a long time. And the change is increasing. Anybody know how many medals did Finland win in the 2016 Olympics? The Finns all like to forget that, so none of them remember that. We only got one bronze medal. Does anybody know how many gold medals did Finland win in the 1924 Olympics? If I remember correctly, we won 17 golds. Finland actually is, I think, the number two country in all time sort of medal rankings in the Olympic Games. So what has changed? Finland has not changed that much. We, we are still doing sports, but the world has grown. Back then, only a few European countries participated in the Games. And that's sort of one sobering example of the, the change. Europe has gotten much smaller. Today, Europe has 7% of the world's population. We have 17% of the world imports and exports, 25% of the output, 32% of the university innovation, and 50% of the world's social security costs. I think these numbers will, will all change as we go forward. The first industrial revolution was a process where muscle power was replaced by mechanical power by steam engines. So one aspect that we humans have, one asset that we have, or capability was replaced. The spindle was one of the, the main inventions of the first industrial revolution. Can anybody guess how long it took for the spindle to spread globally? It took 120 years, which is quite amazing. The second industrial revolution was about electricity and the assembly line. You know how long that took to spread around the world? Actually, we don't know yet because it has not happened yet. 17% of the world population lack access to electricity. So that's still underway. The third industrial revolution was about computers and the internet. How long will that take? There's still 4 billion people who don't have access to the internet. They have the technical ability to access the internet, but they just don't have the devices or the electricity. But that basically spread globally in about a decade, the ability to connect to the internet. And now the fourth industrial revolution is about augmenting intelligence. And what is that based on? First of all, the digital revolution. What does that create? It creates data. It creates a huge amount of data. And the IoT evolution will multiply that by a big number. The amount of data that we have is mind-boggling. Data feeds artificial intelligence or machine learning. There are only two things that machine learning needs. It needs data and computing power. And we're getting more and more of both of those every year. I have been quite interested in, in machine learning for 25 years, 30 years. I used to do 
natural language processing at the university in the 80s. It really didn't work out very well for me or the university or natural language understanding. <laughs> but the, the curiosity remained and when the current AI popularity started increasing about 10 years ago, I started reading a lot of books about the topic and interviewed a lot of the top scientists trying to understand what's happening. And I really didn't understand too much of what really was happening. The scientists, they either spoke at such a general level that it was completely useless, or they tried to make me feel stupid and themselves feel smart, so they spoke in a language that I just couldn't understand. So I decided that I, I actually have to understand this. So this summer I joined a number of courses, programming courses in machine, la machine learning at the Stanford University, online courses, and I started programming again. And I, I learned quite a lot, and my opinions changed. So it again reminded me of the fact that I can read a lot of books and interview people who do certain things, and then I can sound smart. I can give presentations, and I have been giving presentations on AI for several years, but actually getting deep into it myself changes my perception. I wouldn't say the same things anymore that I said earlier. And that's a reminder of lifelong learning. It's a reminder that regardless of our roles, we, we should always think about what is relevant, what is, what is going to change the world, and not expect others to do something about it. We can do something about it ourselves, because you are doing something about something very valuable and important. But there might be certain areas that you are sort of troubled by. What, what does this mean? And you are asking others. You are expecting others to find a solution. But actually, you can do it. I believe that academic degrees should have an expiration date. And if you don't go back to school and do the required courses, it will expire. You don't have a degree anymore. I think that absolutely should happen. Think about as just our life expectation increases and we can't afford to have people retire as early as, as before. A degree cannot survive the, the tooth of time that long. Not even taking into account the exponentially accelerating change. On AI and machine learning, I think there are five things that we should all think about. The first one is achieving at least an intuition of how it works and what it means. All of us should have that. All your students should have that. All your colleagues should have that. It doesn't take that many hours. I could spend an hour talking to you about machine learning to give you that intuition. It would be enough. Then the ones of you who feel that it's really relevant for yourself, you would study more. But all of you would have the intuition that when you bump into a problem, you start thinking, could I solve this problem using machine learning? But then you need somebody to go to, to ask that person, would it work? But you first need to have the, the thought yourself. So the second thing is creating capabilities into the organization or close to your organization so that you have that go-to person. You can go to him or her so that I have this problem. I thought that maybe machine learning could solve this problem. Could it? And can you help me solve it? Can you implement it? So you need to build that capability of people who actually do this professionally. The third one is having a data strategy. You need to have a full understanding of what data does your organization have, or all of you together. You need to have at the logical level a single view to all that data. 
Physically, the data can be stored wherever. Physically, it can be stored in different formats. But logically, you should have a single view to all that data. Because machine learning is all about data. You need to be able to connect the dots. The fourth one is applying machine learning for efficiency and quality. And you should do that in a very systematic fashion because that saves time, it increases quality. You can spend more time on more important things. And then the fifth one is embedding that intelligence into your products and services. This doesn't necessarily as much apply to you as it applies to many companies, but I do believe that education can benefit greatly from using machine learning especially in online education. The exponential change can well be described by an old story that many of you might, may, might have heard already. It's about a stadium, the world's largest sports stadium. You are sitting on the top row of that stadium and you have your binoculars out and you can see the, the grass down below and maybe there's a ball on the, on the grass. But you also see a, a water hose. And from the end of that hose, you can see one drop of water coming out. And while you are watching, in a minute's time, two drops of water come out. And as you watch, in two minutes, four drops of water come out. And as you might guess, in a minute's time, eight drops of water come out. And as you keep watching, minute by minute, you start realizing that there's quite a lot of water coming out. So how long would you guess that it takes before your feet get wet? What would you guess? Anybody? One hour. One hour. Okay. Anybody else? It takes about 45 minutes. So that was a great, great guess. Many people would guess two weeks or something like that. Of course, you, you are educated. It's not surprising that some people expect that it would take much longer than it does. And of course, you don't need to guess because you're sitting there. You're seeing the water level all the time. But what is really surprising is that when 44 minutes have gone and you look down and the water level is way below you, you will still, and you will even think at that time that I still have time, Maybe I'll go and buy a hot dog. And in one minute's time, you'll be underwater. Somehow in, in us humans, there's an inability to really understand exponential growth. We understand it mathematically, but when we experience it around us, we really don't get it. We get it too late. And we see exponential development around us in so many different topics. Do you know what, which company invented the digital camera? The first digital camera in the world. Well, actually, Nokia, Nokia Bell Labs invented the, the physics that is behind all cameras. But it was Kodak. And Kodak was a company with 175,000 employees at the end of the 90s. It had an 85% market share in photographic paper. A very, very profitable company. They had invented the digital camera a couple decades before. At that time, the camera, the first one, had 100 times 100 pixels. And it was black and white, very poor quality. But every year it got better. And anybody with any sense could have taken a, a ruler, not even sort of trying to draw, draw an exponential curve, but just a linear one, and figure out that there will come a day when the quality and capabilities of digital cameras will very likely surpass that of film cameras. But this company that invented it and watched it very closely, it was at the core of their business. At the end of the 90s, they decided that it's not the time to in invest in digital photography. 
and they went bankrupt just a few years later with 175,000 employees and an 85% market share in photographic paper and film. So it's, it's really surprising how incapable we are of foreseeing developments that have been going on for a long time. And we have lots of data points. And mathematically, we understand what is happening. But on the 44th minute, we miss it. If you take a sports team, let's say a soccer team that starts losing, and it has lost five games in a row, there's a huge crisis. The sports sections of all newspapers are crying how the coach should be fired and the star player is completely failing and should be ashamed. And everybody knows that there's a crisis. All the players know. The whole team knows. Just five lost games in a row. Think about a company that is losing its competitiveness. It might take years before the company realizes that it has lost competitiveness. What often happens is the company has a great brand because it has had great products. People are still buying based on that brand. And the company financials, which are historical opinions, not even histo historical facts, they are opinions, numbers, they still keep going up. Like somebody doing a ski jump, you are still going up and forward, but there's no ground underneath anymore. And soon you'll start going downwards. Think about a university that starts losing competitiveness. How long does it take for the university to realize that they are not competitive anymore? Because the metrics are not that clear. It can take a decade, 20 years, before there's a real sense of crisis. How about a nation? Finland lost its competitiveness after the year 2000. We were number one in everything. You, you couldn't find a survey or a study where Finland wouldn't have been number one or number two or number three at least. Because the, the best schools, best students, most patents per capita, most networked nation, most competitive country, most innovative country, you, know, you name it, we had it. And the whole nation somehow psyched itself into believing that if we now stop changing, things will always be good. Let's stop all change. Let's start, just come up with new ways to freeze things, to protect people against change. And we have been sliding downwards ever since. And somehow we brought that up on ourselves. Now we are starting to change again. It took us at least 15 years to wake up. Many of us have been trying to, to cry out much earlier, but the country, the politicians, the establishment hasn't been ready to believe that we need to change again. And the school, when it starts to lose competitiveness, a single school or a whole educational system, how long does it take for that system to realize that it's sliding downwards? Now, how ready is the, the establishment to believe that when somebody crow, cries out for the wolf, that there's an actual wolf out there? It is hard. So, what kind of skills do we need to teach our young ones in the future with this exponential change? I don't know, who, who among you feel that change has never been as fast as it's today? You're all wrong. And that's not the way to think about it. The right way to think about it is, is change will never be as slow again as it, it is today. If you think about it that way, then it, 
encourages you to act. If you just say that change has never been as fast before, then you just observe a fact. So in this world, what kind of skills do we need to teach? I have a few ideas that actually all relate to how I believe companies should be run, how people should be led. The first one is instilling a sense of ownership into kids. How many of you have rented a car? All of you. How many of you have washed it? <laughs> oh, a few, few people. What's wrong with you? <laughs> people typically don't wash rental cars. They don't have any sense of ownership for them. It's somebody else's problem. So when I took, talk to say people graduating from a university, I always tell them that don't go to work for any company which feels like a rental car for you. Find a company or an organization that feels like your own car. You have a sense of ownership. So what, what comes out of having a sense of ownership? It is that you care. You care what happens in that organization. You care what its customers experience. You see something small going wrong, and you feel a sense of ownership for that, even if it's not your role, even if it's not the tightly defined role that, that you have. You care, and you act. You do things that are beyond what is expected from you. And if we can instill that sense of ownership about the world, about the environment, about the society, about the people close to you, into kids, we are a long step in a good direction. The second one is taking a long-term view, understanding that a short-term gain may be a major long-term loss. Making that real, making people lift their eyes from looking at the tips of their shoes to look to the horizon, and instilling that behavior very deeply into them, so that no matter what the topic is, they always think that, hey, am, am I now too short-sighted? They ask themselves that question. And should I actually be looking longer into the future? Should I help my, my friend here think about the long-term repercussions of the actions we are contemplating to take? For business leaders, that is essential, but very difficult, because often we are praised on taking the short-term action. And we are typically not praised when we think about the long-term and do what is necessary to be successful in the long term. We should learn from history. We should respect history. But we should nurture a very healthy and strong suspicion that the way things have been done before is not optimal. Almost a dislike of having to do things the same way they have been done before. As if, if I have to do things the same way, then I failed to come up with a better way. And this is also a, a business lesson that I have learned many times, where the, the best advisors in the world, the lawyers, the accountants, the bankers, they tell you that this is the way to do X. And you first completely believe that, you switch your brains off, you just do what they say, then maybe you, you start having nagging suspicions that maybe there would be a better way. This doesn't feel like really smart, but they must be right, because they charge so much. And then maybe some years later, you start first doubting what they say, not in a disrespectful way, but challenging them to come up with a better way. 
And sometimes you have an intuition of what would the better way look like. Maybe you can't implement it yourself. You can't explain in detail how it can be done, but you can tell them what would a better way look like and challenge them to do it. And if we can instill that respectful suspicion into kids, and they will challenge you as well, helping you to improve. I think any good entrepreneur is a paranoid optimist. And I'd like our kids to be paranoid optimists. And if that sounds scary to you, it, it shouldn't, because it's a balance. And in nature, things should be in balance. Being an optimist means that we always believe we'll, we'll survive, we'll succeed, we'll find a way. No matter what challenge we face, there's always a way. Being a paranoid means that we are thinking forward. We're thinking about things that could go wrong. We're preparing, we're mitigating. We have plans, we have alternatives. And because we are worried about what might go wrong, and we are thinking about that, things actually will go wrong much more rarely. Because we do small things right away that will reduce the likelihood of things going wrong in that particular way. And we are increasing the likelihood of things going right. And that actually feeds back to being an optimist, because we experience that things go well. So we, we have fuel for the optimism. But that fuel comes from being a paranoid. So being a paranoid optimist as a life philosophy creates a good balance. The next one is demanding alternatives. There always should be alternatives. If you are making a decision without any alternatives, you're not making a decision. You just see one path in front of you, and you just walk forward. Don't make any choices. You don't add, in, add any value. Having alternatives and choosing which way to go can create value. There are always forks in the road. There was a fork in the road, and I took it. If you don't know where you are going, you'll definitely end up somewhere else. And there are many ways to, to express the lack of alternatives. Keeping your eyes open, imagining other futures, and choosing which one you want to take. And finally, I believe that the world is, world is changing in a, in a fundamental way because of the, the technology, the, accelerating speed of change. And one way to think about that is, is something you may have heard also before. It relates to a model of the world which is measured by two dimensions. One of them is the simplicity of the environment. And the other one is the predictability of the environment. And if we have a simple environment which is predictable, that could be, for example, I'm a, I'm a nerd, so I'll use, an, as an example, playing a video game. Some of you may have seen a Donkey Kong game in your, in your youth. Some of you are too young to, to have played that game. If I give you the task to play Donkey Kong well, you can do that. It always happens the same way. The barrels rolling down a, a slope, and they always come at the same time, and there's always the same number at the, at the same sort of phase of the game. You just learn it by heart. It is simple. It's extremely predictable. If I tell you to code that game, it's still pretty predictable, but it's not simple anymore. It's rather complicated. You need to study the programming language and the programming environment, and you need to figure out solutions for all the issues that are in these, these sort of problem-solving situations. But you can do it. 
But then if I tell you to code a game that would become number one in the Apple App Store, top grossing list, that's no longer predictable. Nobody knows how to do that. Nobody knows in advance what kind of a game will be the next number one game in the world. It's completely unpredictable. And it is complicated. And that combination of complicated and unpredictable is called complexity. And I believe that the world is becoming a complex place. So how do you survive in complexity? You experiment. That should be an inbuilt uh, sense, inbuilt inclination in you, the experiment. You demand alternatives, which means that you need to create alternatives, which means that you experiment and you learn. You don't do what doesn't seem to work, but you continue doing what seems to work and you create new experiments to evolve. And of course, this is an experiment that you're participating in, in right now, which is, which is wonderful. And you need to, based on what you're learning here, you need to start new experiments. And that's the only way to move forward in the complex world. I'll stop here. I hope there's time for a short dialogue. If somebody would like to comment or ask questions, shoot me down. I, I think if you have time, we have time as well. So any, any questions? Luck, luckily, the audience is consisting of non-Finnish people as well, so they might be a question as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because yeah, I, in I, Finland, we have the tradition of not asking anything from anyone. <laughs> I, I immediately knew that there's a non-Finnish audience because the first row is almost full. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay, any questions? Questions? There's one. Yep. Yes, please. So I have a question regarding a long-term view versus long-term action. How do you define those? Because uh, as an entrepreneur, you need to take actionable execution is key. So how do you balance between short-term and long-term actions? With great difficulty. <laughs> there's there's no, no recipe for that. But the people rarely forget the short-term. I mean, we are reminded about the short-term all the time. Our friends, our colleagues, the environment around us, they remind us in multiple ways, hey, there's a fire burning there. We need to stomp it out. Very few people remind us of the long term. We need to do that ourselves. And we need to remind our friends and colleagues about the long term. So that's the difficult part. I don't think balancing it is too difficult. It's, it's very rare for people to take, make the error of spending too much time thinking about the long term. But of course, you need to have a balance there as well. I'm sure you will easily find it. When you were talking about making experiments and so on, what is your take on something not working out, making mistakes or whatever? Because that's a crucial well, part of... You know, the funny thing is that if you have one path forward and it doesn't seem to be working out, you're afraid of admitting that because you have nothing left. If this doesn't work, there's nothing left. So you continue too long. You shut your eyes from the obvious. When you're experimenting and you have five paths forward, you actually hope that some of them will turn out to be failures quickly. Because you know that you can't walk down all five paths at the same time. You're not flexible enough. So hoping that some of them will fail takes away fear of failure. And that's at the heart of learning. And it, it, yes, it's a learning experience. A few more. Using the uh, metaphor of the stadium. Uh, using the metaphor of the stadium with the 44 seconds to 45 seconds. Minutes. Where, this yeah, was min one per minute. Minutes. Um, where do you think we are in terms of uh, reaching singularity? <laughs> stadium. I, I think 
Do do we, we have are... do we have time for hot dogs? <laughs> yeah, we we have we definitely have time for hot dogs. We can we can have a four course meal before that happens. But not being even in sight of reaching singularity doesn't mean that there wouldn't be a huge number of fields where machines can outperform humans six to zero in tightly defined question areas. But singularity is, we have no idea how to reach that yet. But I know that it's, it's impossible question to answer, but I'm asking it anyway. Um, how do you see AI, machine learning and so on, will it increase the amount of jobs or will it increase un unemployment? It will un increase unemployment. Yeah. The nature of work will start to change. I mean, it's, it's so easy to name the types of jobs that will be lost because machines can do them so much better than human beings, like car driver. It's, it's just obvious that a machine in the end can do it much better than a human being. And it will be much safer for everybody. But is there a possibility that it's also creating a new kind of opportunities, new kind of companies of course, and so on? Of course. There's, there's great potential for good yeah. in this. But you were just asking about <laughs> exactly. will, will jobs be, be lost. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and cool. Think, think about the, the job of an accountant. It can be so efficiently done by machines. And accountants actually have typically high education. They can do something much more valuable than deciding in which ledger should each paper go. Yeah. We have time for a few more. Please. Uh, my question is, you had mentioned that around the year 2000, Finland ceased to progress. I don't want to play with your words there, but I think that's the way you put it. Mm -hmm. And then about two years ago, there was this aha moment for shift. You know, yeah. What? What, what, in your opinion, caused that aha moment to take place? Or what was that pivot point? Well, the question was, Finland ceased to feel that it should be changing anymore around the, the end of last millennia. And I said that perhaps two years ago, things started to change again. And of course, it was not that sudden. There was no pivotal point. It was just that there was more and more evidence that we were leaving behind, we were being left behind. In education, for example, we used to be number one, no longer. In competitiveness rankings, we were sliding down year after year. And it is you seeing the water level rise. And when it's high enough, you start believing that it is, it is actually rising. But the challenge is believing in that when only 32 drops are coming out of the end of the hose in a minute and being the paranoid optimist that takes that <laughs> early evidence and starts thinking about the long term. What does this evidence mean if it continues? And you build a scenario in your mind that this early evidence means that there might be a scenario that it will continue exponentially. What will that mean? And then you start preparing, mitigating, planning. Scientists were the first stakeholder group that saw that. And of course, nobody listens to them when they are saying these unhappy things. That's unfortunately the, our nature at the moment. And that's why we should become more of fact-based paranoid optimists. We have time for one more, one more question. Uh, let's, go, let's go to Mary. Thank you. Um, with your point about the uh, increasing loss of jobs with uh, technology and your idea of um, the paranoid optimism, what would you think would be the most important human uh, traits or nature to cultivate in our children? That's a great question to wrap up this session. <laughs> Easy one. Yeah. <laughs> well, I tried to actually summarize some of the, the most important aspects by the, the six 
sort of list of six aspects or characteristics. But if I will answer your question a little bit differently, not the question that you asked, this was too difficult. <laughs> so I'll, I'll, I'll answer an easier question. So what should we all do about that potential loss of jobs or change in the nature of work? I think we should cr create an environment where people facing this new way of working, where they, have, they are becoming more freelancers, they have several part-time jobs that they are doing, and they probably will never have a full-time job anymore. But they still feel that I'm, I'm, a, I'm contributing, my contribution is valuable, I'm doing good things for the society, I have good self-esteem, I have every right to be self-confident. And basically all these characteristics are things that are usually associated in being an adult. Kids don't necessarily have all these characteristics. As they grow into adulthood, they become more confident. They believe in their own capabilities of coping with whatever life will throw in front of them. And that is actually part of your job as well. Of course, the, the parents should be doing a lot of that, but you can help. And the society can do a lot of that. I actually believe in the concept of basic income because that can greatly alleviate the pain and sort of bring a systemic feeling of right into the environment where people will not be able to have a full-time job. So if we change the foundation in such a way that we actually expect people to have multiple jobs and possibly not even in combination those coming up to the same amount of available work than a full-time job earlier brought to people. So again, we need to build the structures that enable people to live their lives with their heads held up high in whatever situations we, we might face. And that's exactly what we've been talking, talking about these, these two, three days and so on. So I sometimes like to hype people, as you might have noticed, but I think that he was living up to the hype, right? <laughs> and so, so thank you so much for being here.